Good morning, everybody. Welcome to week eight of Forensic Psychology. We are officially in phase two of the course. Phase one was the history, the development, the origins of forensic psychology. But now we're taking forensic psychology to court. Let's get excited. Legal precedent, Your Honor, going back to 1789 whereby a defendant can claim self-defense against an agent of the government if that act is deemed a defense against tyranny, a defense of liberty. <clears throat> Your Honor, Henry Ward Beecher in Proverbs from the Plymouth Pulpit, 1887, said, 1887. and I quote, this is excuse century, me, Your excuse Honor. me, it's make a of the court I am afforded the right to speak in my own defense, sir, by the Constitution of the United States. This is the same document which the guarantees my liberty. The United States. Now, liberty, in case you've forgotten, is the soul's right to breathe. I mean, it cannot take a long breath. Laws are girded too tight. Without liberty, man is a sinko. Man is a what? Ibid, Your Honor. Son, my turn. I've been sitting here for 10 minutes now looking over this rap sheet of yours. I just can't believe it. June 93, assault. September 93, assault. Grand theft, auto, February 94. Where apparently you defended yourself and had the case thrown out by citing free property rights of Hoss and Carrick from 1798, joke. January 95, impersonating an officer. Mayhem, theft, resisting, all overturned. I'm also aware that you've been through several foster homes. The state removed you from three because of serious physical abuse. You know, another judge might care, but you hit a cop, you're going in. Motion to dismiss is denied. $50,000 bail. Thank you. say let's take forensic psychology to court. Now I don't know if you'll remember this but in one of the earliest lectures that we had we talked about this issue at the center of basically all criminal cases. Culpability. right? And I asked you what culpability meant and we talked our way through it. And what culpability basically means is it means blame. It means this psychological kind of comprehension of the degree to which somebody is responsible and in control of their actions right and it's a really interesting and and complicated concept to be thinking about but it's at the heart of every single legal case is unpacking and, and indeed arguing the degree to which the person in the cases that they're that the evidence shows that they did it right. It's about arguing the degree to which they were responsible for their actions from a psychological standpoint. What was going on in their mind and that battle within themselves between their mind and their brain, their behavior and their brain, right? This almost this separation of self. And a really good example of this that I saw the other day was um, I watched, you know, Sinner season one. And I won't spoil it for those of you who haven't, but in, in Sinner season one, Jessica Biel's character, happy, you know, happy wife, happy life, uh, on, the, on the beach one day, sees this guy and goes over and murders him. Right? There's no, the, the debate isn't did she do it or not. She very clearly did it. The entire show is based around learning what were all of these extenuating factors, right? These psychological factors, if you will, environmental, developmental, social factors, that at that time, in that moment, were playing a part in her behavior. And like, it is such a, a central element of the legal room, and it's such an ele a central element of, of human behavior as a whole. How many times have you behaved, done something, snapped, you know, been been snippy or something like that. How many times and then do you look back on yourself and think I wasn't really that wasn't really me. Now, that wasn't really who I am, right? And we're not alleviating all blame. We're not saying that people can can do abhorrent things and that we can alleviate or remove the burden of of, of all blame from them. 
but it's about this grey area of nuance, this grey area of kind of shades of grey in terms of to what degree do we hold that they were in total cognitive control of their behaviours. And it's the job of the psychologist to try and work their way through that. Let me give you one case example before I move into, I guess, the, the, the small bits of theory I have planned for today. I was recently, um, I think it was last summer, I got a phone call. And it was a lawyer. And he basically said that he had this client, right? He was, he was, he was uh, defending the client. And this client had basically used a, used a gun uh, and shot somebody basically in a, outside of a gas station. And basically what happened is these two guys had been in the gas station. Words had been exchanged. And outside the gas station, basically a brawl ensued. And I was like, okay, yeah, I, I, can, I can get this. I think there's a lot of stuff coming out of here, you know, about kind of, you know, fight or flight, stress responses, you know, a kind of a, uh, you, know, a save, you know, a save self kind of perception to things. And then what the lawyer said, and he said, well, I've got a video for you, and it's a bit problematic, uh, and I'll never, I'll never forget it. He said, the, the problem is that after the fight, my client kind of does what can only really be described as a John Wick-style execution. And I was like, oh, oh, okay, a, J a John Wick-style execution. Well, okay, that's slightly different to what I was expecting. And my job as a psychologist, right, was to observe the video, right, and watch the tape and, and read all about the individual and learn all about him and try and assess and, and offer insight into the degree to which the individual's situation, the individual's personality, the individual's past, could in any way be ex explain their decision to commit that crime in that moment. Now, at the same time, very realistically, I could have also done the other thing. Right? I, could have, I could have potentially looked at all of the history and psychology that gives that person pure culpability, and there are no extenuating factors. But in this case, I was on the defence, right? And that's what the psychologist in this case is doing, right? They're using psychology. If you think about a physical scale, tipping scale, right? They're using psychology to tip the scale of culpability, either away from the offender, if you're on the defence, or for the offender, if you're on the prosecution. And it comes down to this base understanding, or if you will, it's almost this lay of the land, this lay law, that no matter what the crime is, if 10 people all do the exact same crime, right? 10 people all do the exact same crime, so 10 murders, 10 robberies, whatever it is, not all 10 people are doing it for the same reasons or driven by the same psychological impulses. And for that reason, we therefore can't say, or we, we ask the question, are all 10 people equally culpable in terms of their conscious control and or awareness to kind of do the crime at that time? Right, and this isn't a new idea. I just wanna show you very briefly. This is a quote from uh, Schmeidenberg in 1947. So what would that be? 67, 75 years ago, give or take, right? So 75 years ago, we're, we're still in a Lombrosian view that fucking head size predicts criminality, right? He says that basically there are four types of criminal. The ordinary man who is driven to crime by, an overwhelming, exter by overwhelming external circumstances. The apparently normal individual who's carried away by an irresistible impulse. The neurotic criminal, who is driven by equally irresistible but unconscious forces, the nature of which is unknown to him, he regards his criminal tendencies as foreign to his personality and tries to vainly to struggle with them. And four, the genuine criminal, who, provide, who prides himself on the delinquent exploits of which he expresses his antisocial attitude. And five, so when I said there were four types of criminal, congratulations to me, there were five. Lastly, a group of criminals whose behavior is the result of mental deficiency or organic illness. Now, those typologies, I'm not gonna say that they, they hold true and we should remember them, but it shows you that even in 1947, there was an awareness that, that there are different routes to which people commit criminal behaviors. 
and that the route that someone goes through, or the factors at play here, affect the degree to which we would perceive them as culpable for their actions, right? So if I look at my, my case, right, of the individual committing the John Wick style execution, right, I could ask the question, which of these five groups of criminal is he? And what are the implications of that for the degree to which I believe that they are culpable? Now, it's a, there is a plethora of ways that you can kind of cut up this question. But if I were to say, I think uh, the main ones that I would say have been popularized, if you will, are kind of, so I group them into kind of social approaches, developmental approaches, and neurological approaches. Which, are, they're all very, very different. There, there's also kind of some other ones in there as well. But, but what psychologists are doing in these cases is they're basically creating different lenses through which we can look at the factors outside of the individual that are likely and or unlikely to affect them. So the first one will be social, right? So one of the things that a psychologist can do is they can look at either the individual's social environment in general and or their social environment at the time in which they committed the crime and they can say that that was a factor or that decreased their degree of culpability. So what they're doing there is it's, they're moving the kernel of blame from the individual to the environment. And they're basically saying that in the presence of all of these peers, right, that the individual was losing a degree of their own control, if you will. And I mean, the, the exponential version of that would be crowd behavior, which is something we study in, in, a, in a few weeks. Or the, the, the minor version of that would be, you know, we know and there's some, some really great research that shows this. When people offend in groups, the offending behavior is more severe. So if someone uh, commits an assault on their own, right, hypothetically speaking, they, let's say they use punches, kicks and, and a knife, okay, or, or just punches and kicks. When people co uh, co-offend in groups, the level of violence exhibited escalates. And the argument being that the presence of everybody else makes everybody be more extreme or changes everybody's behavior. So the social environment at that time is affecting the degree to which an individual controls their own behavior. Culpability moves, right? And you'll see that in yourself. And when we talk about the crime lecture, uh, sorry, the crowd lecture, We'll, we'll talk about that. You know, when you're in a group, you feel more powerful. You feel more uninhibited, right? You're more likely to, to do things that you wouldn't do them on your own. Your brain, your behavior, your cognitive control has all changed because of the social environment in which you found yourself. Ask, you know, Elijah Wood in the film Green Street. I met someone the other day who told me Green Street was their favorite film, which is one of the weirdest takes of possibly all time. But that's one way that we would, you know, consider the social environment. Another would be, and you, you see these stories a lot, right, that, that the environment in which someone was raised is plays a factor in the way in which they perceive the world around them. So let me give you an example of that. So another case I was doing was a, a gang shooting up in, up in Chelsea, Mass. And a lot of it came down to the way in which the individuals at the heart of the shooting interpreted the signals and or signs of the other person so you know how you in what you do is based on your interpretation of what's going on and, and what you think someone else is going to do well you learn those lessons right when you go into a restaurant and you you know that the nice the nice server comes and meets you you go and you sit down at your table you are then bought a, you are then bought a menu and you order your drinks right from a psychological standpoint we call that kind of a schema right it's a learnt a learned series of associations or a learned series of behaviors that we learn from experience. So our social world teaches us what is going to happen and what should happen and it lets us predict the future, if you will, right? So how someone perceives a situation in which they decide to or not to commit crime can largely be affected by what they grew up experiencing and seeing and learning and all of these things. So in that, in that, in that um, criminal case with the, with the gang shooting I was telling you about, the fact that the other person interpreted that he had to shoot or the other person would shoot him, 
That's a learnt interpretation. That's a learnt assumption about what's going to happen based on all of the things that you've seen and experienced um, around the world, right? So that's this idea of this social influence. And, you know, there's other um, really classic stories and examples that I'm sure you can think of. You know, those, those cases of very famous criminals who have had, you know, terrible upbringings or, you know, that they themselves have had abusive parents. And that's a, a big one that a lot of people talk about, the kind of cycle of intergenerational abuse. And it all comes down from a psychological standpoint to this socially constructed or these social influences that then shape our behavior going forward. And so from a culpability standpoint, one of the things that psychologists may look to do, right, is to argue that we aren't in control of those social influences. But once they're learned, they can almost be in control of us. And therefore... We are less culpable if we have learnt a series of abhorrent influences or we've, we've been exposed to a series of abhorrent influences, right? That's the use of this social world, this socially grown through environment to affect the way in which somebody perceives the situation around them, okay? One of the other areas that they'll do is something that, again, and this is, again, a little bit linked to the social, but, but this idea of almost developmental. So what factors in your development you know, are likely to now be affecting the way in which you behave going forward. And in just uh, one of the kind of um, studies that I'm sure as criminologists you will know probably better than I at this point, you know, there's a lot of stuff around kind of, you know, monozygotic and dizygotic twins and showing that basically um, in, in monozygotic twins, again, that should say monozygotic and dizygotic, but basically in twins that share more of a genetic um, makeup, i.e. They, they share the same genetics versus twins that have a, a degree of deviation within their genetics, they are more likely to basically, um, they are more likely to both engage in crime. It's this idea that there is a, a genetic um, predisposition to be engaged in criminal behavior. Now, that's an interesting perspective from the explanation side of things, right? But what you will see in the courtroom with psychology is that that will be used now, and we, we cover this in some of our lectures coming forward, that will be used now as, a, um, as an uh, extraneous variable, right? If someone has, uh, is identified as having certain genes, and those certain genes are linked to the occurrence of violence, if you will, right? Then people have used that to argue that they should have less of a sentence, why? Because they can't control their own genes, they don't own their own genes, they didn't choose their own genes, and at this point they assume that their genes therefore were affecting or driving their behaviour in a way that was out of their control. Interestingly with, with that one, you could also argue the complete opposite, which is that the, the genes are are relatively stable and therefore you can't rehabilitate someone because this violent gene indicator will always be there. I'm not saying which one of those is right, but what I'm saying is that what psychologists can now do in the courtroom is argue that the way in which your genetic makeup predisposes you to violence can either lower or raise the culpability that you should be subject to in the courtroom because your genes, which you don't realistically control, your genes are influencing or impacting, right, the way in which you will or won't be behaving. Now, one thing I will do, and I'm, I'm a big fan of, rather than giving you a shopping list of factors, I actually think we're going to do a really good job of covering those in the, in the coming weeks, I want to give you kind of a, a broad framework. And so one of the frameworks that I really like is basically this framework by... Uh, this framework by, I didn't even, oh, Ferguson, there we go, I almost didn't write down his name. Um, Ferguson in 2008, which basically is, a, is an integrated model of kind of the catalysts of antisocial behavior that from a psychological standpoint, we can think about using when we are talking about the where in the, where in the person's tapestry of life are the factors that made it more or less likely that they were going to engage in violence when the opportunity arose, and what effect does that have, therefore, on how we interpret their degree of culpability, right? Now, really funny story about this. So this was published in 2008 on my, uh, in my master's. So I was in 2010, 2011, so two years after this came out. 
Um, I proposed an extended catalyst model because I arrogantly thought that I was better than Ferguson. Uh, uh, funnily enough, it didn't go very far. But in my mind, this is a, you know, people, people have said that the extended catalyst model by Shortland uh, as a 21-year-old that never got published is better than this one, but we don't have to worry about that. One day I might publish it. But, but what it basically comes to is it says, okay, there's all of these different influences. When it comes to the, uh, the, the decision to engage in crime, right? And each of those influences are a psychological field unto itself, as we almost unpacked in lecture one there, right? So how do they all interact, or what does that all look like if we integrate that together? So the model that he puts forward basically kind of says that if you think about underneath all of it, there has to be some construct of a violent antisocial personality. Now, personally, I don't even agree. I'm not entirely sure I agree with that. I think that there can be a pre-existing violent antisocial personality. However, I do believe that there are environments that are so extreme and so stressful that it can create a violent reaction in somebody who previously wasn't violent. But that is the, that is the extremities of the cases. That's Jessica Beale season one sinner, right? It's not, it's not everyday cases. So normally you need someone who has a, the capability or the inclination for violent thought, right? And where does that come from? Well, that can come from their genetics. You can be genetically predisposed to have hyper-reactivity in areas of the brain that are associated with violence, conflict, and emotion. It can come from family, right? So again, that's that battle of genetics and social. You can learn through early life experiences that the response to other people or the response to an argument is aggression, right? So you can have, a, you can, you can have the same violent anti-personality and it can come from two different places. It could come from what you've socially learned in the world and the laws that you've learned. You know, when someone takes your toy, you smack them in the face. That's something you can learn. Or when someone takes your toy, you go to the other part of the park and you find another toy, right? Lessons people learn. That's not how I'll, I'll try and be a better parent than that. And the other is that there can be this genetic or, if you will, neural predisposition, right? So these two kind of underlying factors can culminate, if you will, in a kind of a violent antisocial personality disorder. What that violent anti-personal, uh, anti-social personality disorder does is it teaches you or gives you a, a range of behaviours that you can use when you are presented with a stressful, um, a stressful or, or you know stressful situation or, or an opportunity in which you know violence could be outcome. Right. So in many individuals, let's say in the non-violent anti-social personality situation. If there is a confrontation or if there is a altercation, their behavioural range may go for may include walk away, uh, resolve with non-violence and or words, um, or you know, or, or 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 call for help or something like that, right? But these are, these are what would you do if you were in the gas station and you got in an altercation over a pack of sour patch kids, right? You may have your own range of behaviours that come to mind. For other people, potentially those who have a violent antisocial personality disorder, their range of behaviours may be far more aggressive. And actually, this is a side story. This is something we actually tested really... Uh, you can actually test it really interestingly. You give people a story stem task, and we, we did this in a study of ours, and we basically said, like, you're driving along the street and someone crashes into the back of you. Words to that effect. What are ten things you would think you could think or do in response to this situation. So what, basically, what would you do next? And some people write, you know, cry, call my mother, check the other person's okay, call an ambulance. And some people write, get out, yell at them, smack them, right? So you can see that different people have different behavioral reactions or ranges. And the psychological argument is that stems from kind of who they are internally as a person. So you can have all of these things, right? So you've got your inputs, you've got your genetics, maybe you've got your social family environment, you've got your culminating, if you will, in a violent antisocial personality or at the very least a, a violent antisocial proclivity for reactivity, if you will. And then that creates this behavioral range, how you generally react to situations. Now, what's interesting is then when that situation where, that is, where there's that environmental catalyst, Right, so that stressor, if you will, the altercation in the gas station or, you know, whatever it may be, you know, the, the, the gang altercation at the, at the party in Chelsea case, things like that, right? 
an environmental catalyst triggers a series of potential behaviours from you. Now, what, and then what you have, is, and you, you should all know about this one at least, is you then basically have this idea of impulse control, right? You have the ability, in theory, to inhibit your impulses, right? So imagine the situation. Imagine you're driving down the street, as we all do, and some absolute schmuckville in a Mercedes just nicks in front of you. Now, you're, you can often have a, a few reactions to that. One is to swear at them. That's a good reaction. One is to absolutely nail the horn. One is to chase them and tailgate them, right? Because you are so because you want to basically teach them a lesson or show them that you're annoyed. Right? We all have these behavioural reactions, okay? In most cases, we are able to control that impulse, and what we actually do is we kind of fictionalise and fantasise about the things we could have done while actually doing nothing, which is good. You didn't do anything. You didn't escalate the situation. And, Cathartically, you make yourself feel better by living a fantasy in which you beat their head into the, into the hood of their own car until they apologise, right? So in most cases, we, we have impulse control, and it's, it's central to, to, to good behaviour. However, in some cases, the impulse control device fails, or isn't very good. And that leads you to actually, in that situation, enact the violent behaviour that stems from your violent nurse uh, anti-personality, that stems from your genetics or stems from violent violence. Now, as I've already mentioned, I don't think that this model, if you will, is flawless. I, I think it's missing peer influences. I think it's generally missing... I think the environmental catalyst has some nuance. But what it shows you, and I think is really important here, is it shows you that I, as a psychologist, right, if I am looking to tip the scale of culpability, and let's just go with the defence for, 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 for argument's sake, in order to tip the scale of culpability, to convince you that somebody is less culpable for the actions that they've taken, I just need to target one or all of these factors to show you what the, the, the elements of their behaviour may not necessarily have been solely the, the kind of the, the, the conscious controlled causality that we're maybe behaving, right? So I could pick impulse control device. And so I could say from a neurological standpoint, from a genetic standpoint, from a developmental standpoint, that maybe that individual has significant issues with impulse control. And that actually is super, is really important. And like, for example, are you, if there are cases, let's say you have a veteran Right, and, and the veteran has suffered, you know, traumatic brain injuries, and they've, you know, they've had a, a, a steam service serving abroad. But as part of that, you know, they've had head injuries and head trauma that we know is is occurring in a lot of these cases. Or you've got TBI from NFL players, right? That neurological trauma that they suffered can lead to issues in impulse control. It can change morphologically change their brain to the point in which they can no longer control impulses. Now, sometimes that may manifest in suicide, and that's something we see in NFL players, that's definitely something we see in the veteran population. It could also manifest in an inability to control your reactions when there is an environmental stressor and all these kind of things. So it's really, really important, but as a psychologist, that's something I could look at as a kind of a culpability thing. Right? What is their impulse control? You know, How good is it and what might affect it? I can also look at the behavioural range. Where are they learning what to do in a situation like this? Where are they learning these scripts? Where are they learning the stories that they're using or that, that they're creating when they're in these uncertain high-stakes situations, right? In the gas station example, why did the guy assume that the other guy was going to shoot him unless he shot the, unless he shot the other guy? Where's that lesson come from? That's not something that everybody leaps to. Is it from his young childhood? Is it from the movies that he's seen? And that's a big one that people look at. Is it from, you know, was he, was, was he himself a veteran? And it's something that, that automatically is, 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 uh, is, you know, is coming to him. You know, the use of the firearm for self-defense in stressful situations. Like, where is that learned script come from? Does that, do they have a violent antisocial personality? And if they do, that's important. But where does that come from? And does it come from something external to the individual? In that sense, almost are they a victim of their violent antisocial personality? 
right? Or in, in other cases, do they have a violent antisocial personality? And did they actively decide to do harm and actively override their own... Like, they could have not done it, but they actively chose to. You know, that's the opposite. Put, put the culpability scale on the other end, right? But what it gives you is basically a way in which to analyze, unpack, and think about what are the causes of a person's behavior and how can we think about the degree to which they are culpable. So what does this all mean and where are we going to go? So what we're going to do over the next three weeks is we are going to look at a range of different cases. We're going to look at Elliot Turner, my brother's best friend who murdered his girlfriend. We're going to look at Elliot Rogers. Yes, I've got those names right. No, it's not Elliot Rogers. Elliot Rogers is the San Bernardino Kelly. Jack Holmes. Jack Holmes is an IT consultant from my hometown in Bournemouth who went and joined the, um, the, the PKK who were fighting against ISIS and became a sniper and wanted to come home afterwards. And we're going to look at Aaron Hernandez. Can't, can't not do Aaron Hernandez for all the Patriots fans out there. And a fantastic case. And look at what he did and talk about his, uh, how his brain affected it. And in each of these cases, what we're going to have, which I'm, I'm super excited about, is you're going to see me defend or prosecute. So, so use psychology to try and convince you their culpability, if you will. And then you're going to see our research assistants try and do the other way. And you're going to have to decide where on that culpability scale you think they're going to be. And so you're going to experience the feeling of having to use psychology to assess culpability in a legal setting. And in the interim weeks, I'm going to give you the psychology of the cases. I'll give you a bit of psychology on murder, psychology on terrorism, psychology in the brain, and we'll have a good time with all of it. But what I want to do, and I want to start with, I'm just going to start very quickly with one of my favorite cases. And I'm going to show you very quickly, I'm going to give a quick case example. So what we're going to do with the rest of this lecture is I'm going to insert in this video, unless YouTube cancels it because it's definitely copyrighted, I'm going to insert into this video about half of a documentary on a case called the Newberg Four. Now, the Newberg Four, I choose this case for a very specific reason. The Newberg Four is a terrorist operation in which four individuals tried to plant, um, to use bombs and, and, and I think stinger missiles to bomb a synagogue and take down a plane. And they were uh, bought out as such, uh, trialed as such, convicted as such, four equal terrorist offenders. But what's so interesting in this case is when you get into the culpability side of things, you realize that there are four very different psychological stories at play. And how those psychological stories are playing massively impacts how we should be thinking about the degree to which these people are culpable. So this is just a very quick kind of interesting intro case into the world of culpability and this idea of applying psychology to a kind of a real case to help us differentiate how much to blame different people are even when they're doing the same thing, which is absolutely at the heart of this phase of the course. Grading culpability even when everybody does the same, and using psychological principles to think about that relationship between the person and what they're doing. So we're going to start playing that right now, and I'll see you on the other side for a quick debrief.
We have breaking news. The FBI says it has thwarted a terror plot. Federal investigators say the suspects are four men with a shared hatred for America. According to the FBI, the four men intended to carry out their plan today. We uh, targeted four individuals that uh, planned and schemed to uh, bomb two uh, Jewish facilities here in the Bronx and also to take down a military aircraft up at the Stewart uh, Airport. They stated that they, they wanted to commit jihad. Prosecutors described the suspects as extremely violent men who embraced every opportunity for terrorism. The suspects, 55-year-old James Cromaty, the alleged ringleader, 28-year-old David Williams, 32-year-old Onta Williams, and Laguerre Payen, all of Newburgh. Investigators say the four Muslim men met in prison and hatched the terrorist plot at a local mosque. These guys were uh, homegrown uh, Americans living among us, and this is just one cell of many. The FBI is worried about all sorts of things around the country. The good news here is that our FBI and our NYPD did a very, very good job. The fact that we've been able to penetrate these groups early on they were being monitored for close to a year. This is truly a, a textbook example of how a, a, a major investigation uh, should be conducted. go out of town and people ask where you're from and when you say Newburgh the response and the reactions that you get is almost like offended you're like you, you know you feel embarrassed to be from here you know the way people act like oh Newburgh you see the streets and you know, the homes for every actually living space in Newburgh there's like five condemned you know I remember as if it was yesterday. We were right up in this area, right here. And I remember he was sitting right over here on that side, and it was a ch the table here, and he made his statements. That a woman should not be seen or heard. And it was like, is this how he introduced himself to us? He's going to tell us women should, be, should not be seen or heard? He gave us this persona as though he was a businessman and he would come in different fine cars. I've seen him in a BMW. I've seen him in a Hummer. I've seen him in a Mercedes Benz. And you got a lot of people around here who don't have no work. They don't have money. They don't have anything. And he would maybe take $50 out and buy so many lunches and just give them to people. I first met him, it was on a Friday. I'd done the Juma here, the Friday prayer service here. And I met him out here in this very parking lot. I said, can I help you? He said, yeah. I'm sure you can tell me, you know, about Jihad. That of all the things for him to be concerned about, he would ask about Jihad. He would ask about a holy war. And we asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect his people from any more harm. To stand I did tell different individuals, I said, stay the hell away from him. Some ain't right about it.
Shahid Hussein, he claims, is his real name, although nobody knows. His background is for bankruptcy, felony arrests, uh, lying on his uh, immigration papers. He had become fluent in the language of jihad. felt that, look, this guy can come around here as much as he wants because he's not going to be able to get anybody here. Everybody here is straight. So it was a shock that he hung around long enough to be able to get somebody to buy into his plot. When Hussein first approached James Cromedy in the parking lot of the Newburgh Mosque, he presented himself as a wealthy Pakistani who had come to the United States to meet people. And Cromedy says, in the biggest mistake of his life, those look like Pakistani shoes. And Shahid Hussein says, they are. Do you know about Pakistani shoes? And James Cromedy says, I've been to Pakistan, which he'd never been to. And so he knew about these shoes. He maybe saw them on TV and CNN. They then struck up a relationship that went on for months. Oh, wow. What car is this? This is my uh, Beam Beamer. This is the BMW? Yeah. Yeah, they paint it? No, that one. This is the other Beam Beamer. Oh, yeah, yeah it's the other one. one. Right. Yeah. I'm about to say, yeah, that's right, you got two Beamers. Yeah, that's right. I got two Beamers. I thought you had a Mercedes, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got a Mercedes. Huh? I have a Mercedes. Right? You can pull the seat yeah. back, huh? Yeah. Ooh! I'm talking about this. Ah! <laughs> so we have the money here? <laughs> yes. To someone like Mr. Cromedy, who had spent his entire life in poverty, trying to support himself as a very low-level marijuana dealer, also working the night shift at Walmart, making about $14,000 a year. I mean, it, that was a very big thing to him, Mr. Shaheed Hussein's wealth. And Hussein played on that tremendously. What is your understanding that you make a lot of money and still be on the side of Allah? That'll be good, but I have to know what I'm going to do to make the money. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of ideas, okay, for you, okay? James, he lived around the corner, you know, down the street and around the corner in the projects over there. He struck me as somebody who liked to hear himself talk. I got a 10 murder, I did 15, 10 or 20, so. He was only 12 years old, so imagine what I do to a grown man. He was 12 years old, the kid I shot. I don't care if he was three years old, if he pull a gun on me, I'm gonna take him down. James talked for hours, talking about crimes that he committed that never happened, talking about things that he had done that he had never done to impress Shahid Hussein. That whatever you need me to do, and it's feasible a lot, I'm gonna do it. And I'm gonna get away with it. And Shahid Hussein introduced the idea that he was connected to J-E-M, Jaish A. Muhammad, and which is a legitimate terrorist organization that's on the United States watch list. Jaish A. Muhammad wish uh, jihad because they are funding every each and everything. Sure. So they're funding the money, so it's their show, you know, yeah. and uh, let them run the show. So, I mean, uh, everything comes from from there, so uh, the cars, the money. In your mind, were your best targets here in New York? The best targets already been hit. Okay, now, but what do you think you could do? The best targets you will have in your mind. 
I would like to hit the bridge. But bridges are too hard to be hit because of their of their made of steel. I renamed you two places last week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like you ignored me. Mm -hmm. I, I do have a brain. The brain that there, I do have one of those. This is the uh, uh, Riverdale Temple. Riverdale Temple. Right? Yeah. Matter of fact, yeah, that's the Riverdale Temple. Man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This, this, is, this is excellent. Because how can you go wrong? Everything is right there. I hate those bastards. No disrespect. Those fucking Jewish bastards. If you can get some people, it'll be nice. If you be a body, it'll be nice. Okay? Do you have to use that word body? It's body. B O D D D Y U E W X Y Z. No. <laughs> Real good Muslim brothers would be nice, you know? James Cromedy, this is a guy who has spent some time in prison for drug crimes, not for violent crimes. And it seems like Cromedy thinks that he hit the jackpot. Unfortunately to Hussein, Cromedy doesn't seem all that interested in actually going through with the plot. Uh, but you said that you would be good to get some brothers together. And... Don't worry about the brothers. Don't worry. You're gonna meet some brothers. This be <laughs> Inshallah, I, I'm hoping we can uh, we can do it. Don't worry and about brothers. This hold your seat. Are you sure, brother? You can get the brothers. I'm trying. Just like you said, Allah makes things happen. True. Sure. Maybe it's not my mission then. So what do you think I should say to my guys back in New York? Tell your brothers we need some more time. That's what you need to talk. I want to recruit a guy. I want to get some guy. Well, this, let, me, let me just try one more thing. Okay. Let me just try one more thing. If not, don't worry about it. I'll call it off. In 2009, James Cromedy kind of goes AWOL. For a long time, he goes out of contact with Hussein. Hussein starts calling Cromedy. Cromedy's not answering. Hussein goes to the mosque, no sign of Cromedy. He starts asking people at the mosque, have you seen James? Have you seen James? He goes around Newburgh, have you seen James? And Shahid Hussein hears that James Cromedy is back around. Hello? You you remember me now? Talk to no, me. No, no, brother. Know you could talk to me. Listen to me. Yes, Listen brother. to me. I don't left the place and everything. I just left. I can make you $250,000, but you don't want it. What can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> we can laugh. Okay, come see me, brother. <laughs> 250,000 means no more Newburgh. This is a small city just soaking and drowning in poverty. I mean, your kids are struggling, and you know, you're, you're in debt up to your ass. Somebody offers you a large chunk of change, <laughs> fresh out of jail. I'm interested in what it's our idea. Okay, uh, what's what's it about? What do we got to do? Assalamu alaikum. Khatija. Thank you, brother. Your family love you, brother. Huh? Your family love you, brother. Huh? Do you think these these guys will do for the money or for the cause? They would do it for the money. <laughs> They're not even thinking about the cause. I was about five years old when my parents asked me what I was going to do with my life. When I told my parents I was going to go to law school and join the FBI, my mother only heard the law school part. My father only heard the FBI part, and uh, both of them were happy. 
and a friend of mine had a case against neo-Nazi skinhead groups, and I looked very young, and I had blonde hair and blue eyes. So I've spent most of the next 12 years working undercover in some form or another. Having worked terrorism for 12 years, I found that it was really everything that I wanted it to be until September 11th, unfortunately. The mood within the FBI after 9-11 was that the rules don't apply anymore. The FBI was being threatened with being carved up. We're going to create MI5 out of part of the FBI. But the one message that was clear, and for me and, and the other FBI executives at the time, it was there will be no tolerance for another terrorist attack in this country under any circumstances. Immediately after 9-11, I mean, there were actually FBI agents going through the hallway saying, the rules are off now, the rules are off. And I remember saying to one, what rules are you talking about? You know, are you talking about the Constitution? <laughs> Do you think the Constitution is off? So unfortunately, part of what the FBI did was treat the entire Muslim community as suspect. This is David when he was a baby. And he still looks the same. He was just such a cute baby. He was a really happy kid, really, really happy kid. This is David when we first came to Newburgh. Look at that sweet little face. This is where David would come and hang out with all these little kids that say hello to you. He would teach them how to lift weights and stuff. David's a sweetie. He's a sweetheart. You know, got a kind soul. Um, went through changes and struggles in his life, like all of us. We, you know, we're a dysfunctional family, like everybody else, you know, but we love each other to death. And when the drugs start hitting Newburgh, David became selling drugs, selling crack, and became this big man in Newburgh from his drug dealings. And then he went to jail for five years um, and came home and went to school, wanted to make a difference. He was doing really, really good in college and going to school part-time. I was so proud of him. And then March 12th, I took my child to the hospital, my son, Lord. And the doctor, he's never seen a case like this before. They say he needed a liver. They found some tumors in his liver. At first, they was like, I have leukemia, and I had a blood cancer. I had thrombocytosis, sarcoidosis. David had came to visit me, and um, I was just telling him that, yo, I'm mad, scared. I never see my brother cry. So, like, when I see him cry, that's when I, I kind of knew it was serious, because they kept telling me I had, like, all these things, but I really didn't, I really didn't, like, it didn't really sink in, like, like, how bad it was. But when I see him crying, it was like, Oh, this shit is real. David thought that money would help get Lord a liver when they took out that tumor. The tumor was the size of a watermelon. We don't got no fathers around, and that's my baby brother, and I want to help him. David was outside crying, and James came up to him and asked him, why are you crying? He said, my brother's about to die and my mother don't have the money. He said, wait, let me go talk to somebody I know. I was at the hospital. I get a phone call from David. He says, tell the doctors to go ahead. I got the money. He said, I met this Muslim brother that's gonna help us. I just was like, mm-hmm. If that's what you say, they're like, no, Ma, seriously, you could trust him. No, that's your friend. It's not my friend. It's just something shady. Whenever someone puts it out there and, and makes it so easy for you and they tell you how much they love you and they don't even know you, their motives are something. Their intentions are something. They want something from you other than your friendship. David Williams comes in, and Shahed Hussein says, let's go to the airport at Stewart Air Force Base. So they drive up to the airport, and they look at the planes. 
Stewart Air Force Base is the base that sends Air National Guard and National Guard troops at the time over to Iraq and Afghanistan. And Shahed Hussein says, we should blow up one of these. How do you blow up one of these? Oh, I can get you a missile. Uh, the rocket launcher, not the stinger. Oh, you got a stinger. I got a stinger, not a rocket launcher. Oh, a stinger. That's the sun, right? Hmm? The sun. It's the sun, yeah. yeah. I mean, in 20 minutes, they won't even know what happened yeah. to the plane. It could be people there. Like, you don't hurt nobody. The whole Somebody point. could be on that plane cleaning planes or something. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You want to just destroy property. You want to take the lives. Yeah, he'll, he'll tell you that in a minute. Yeah, me too. That's what I'm saying. We ain't, we ain't for I taking that exactly one. I know exactly what you're saying. I'm trap. That's, that makes perfect sense. But like you said, around told David that he needed some more people. Make sure they're Muslims. That's what he told David. Whoever you get, make sure they're Muslim, because they needed a driver. I'm like, wow. Just make sure they're Muslims. You know, I remember, you know, years ago, we used to go after people we said were communists. Then we went after gang members, you know, during the whole war on drugs. And that literally led to the incarceration of a whole generation of African-American men. So now, okay, so Muslims are the new thing. When I was elected, I was the first Muslim ever to be elected to Congress. And we, you know, experienced a torrent of uh, uh, invective and hate and, and all that kind of and suspicion and, and, and insult. And when you channel a vast array of law enforcement resources towards a particular community, no doubt, you're going to get some bad actors because there's bad actors in every community. This is, oh, right, guess what? Right, we got two more brothers, huh? MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Huh? What, we got, what? I got two more brothers, huh? Wow. Alhamdulillah. Huh? <laughs> That's it, dua. Alhamdulillah. Ante, I met Ante when I got older. And Ante was one of the older guys that I actually looked up to. We out there gang banging, man. We out there riding on people, beating up people, not going to school, not working, you know. And he'd be like, "Yo, man, you know, you guys got to do something with yourself, you know. What I mean, this ain't it, you know. Like this, this better than this. Well, like when you ain't got much, and all you got is love, you know, that really counts. It really do count. Like somebody does care." Ante Williams was working at a factory, not making very much money. He did spend time in prison, never for anything violent. It was a sad life. It hadn't been a particularly successful life. A lot of people say Newberg has a black cloud over him. I'm grateful for that, though, because it makes me appreciate what I have. And where I got that from is Ante. Humble. It's one of his favorite words. We appreciate what we had to work hard for. The last person to come to the picture is Laguerre Payen, born a Christian in Haiti. He was completely lost. He had become feral, without food, without jobs, without prospects. He was living in a little SRO room in Broadway in Newburgh and had no connection really with society. Laguerre is a person who's in many ways challenged intellectually, challenged emotionally. One of the brothers I'm worried about him. Okay. Because he's right. a little slow. Okay. He needs a lookout. That's all he needs. That, that lookout. That's what he's going to be. And that's all he's going to be. There's nothing else. When I met Laguerre, I was on the second floor of 280 Broadway. I had my office there. It was a crack house, 
at one time when social service would give him some money, he had some money. Apart from that, he didn't have any money. Somebody else. At this moment, where are you living? Right there, back there. 222. Oh, 222 what? Broadway. Oh, 222 Broadway. I'm just, I need to make some money. Mm-hmm. I need to find me a good little job, you know, don't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hussein's appeal is, if you do this, you will never in your lifetime, whatever you're doing, make as much money as I will pay you for three weeks' work. I will give you food for those three weeks. I will give you a car. I will give you a job. They were all going to fly to Florida. I should have known something was up with Laguerre as far as money was concerned. You know, when he says so, and he would have all the money he needed. So I said, brother, I said, you know, to Laguerre, Laguerre, don't get yourself in no trouble, man. He said, it ain't going to be no trouble, but I'm, I'm just, I'm, I know I'm going to have a lot of money. Their plan ultimately is they're going to create two backpacks of bombs, 30 kilograms of plastic explosive with 500 ball bearings in each bag. And they place them outside of two houses of worship in Riverdale, one a Jewish center and one a temple. And then they have two Stinger anti-aircraft missiles that they're going to use to blow up planes at a Stewart Air Force Base. Hussein was going to provide all the materials and the money and everything else to make the work happen. And then at the end, he was going to pay them all $250,000, cars, trips, whatever they wanted. Riverdale is a very lush, comfortable community on the banks of the Hudson River. Riverdale also has a large Orthodox Jewish population. It's by far the richest area of the Bronx. It's a community with a lot of political clout. It's very near to Manhattan. And it's a place where if something happens, people are going to pay attention to it, as opposed to if something happens in Newburgh, New York, where a lot of people don't even know where it is. How many of you come? First place you get in the bomb. And you know what's crazy? No, you don't bring anybody to The only thing you can touch is your phone. It's crazy. And the phones will be destroyed right away. Once the thing explodes, throw your phones away. Garbage them, break them, burn. And guess what? Put it in the train, put it in the river. Get rid of it. And I'm letting y'all know right now. After this is all over, tell the brother what you want to do. You want to go to Florida, Miami, Hawaii. I'm a little brother. When Hussein came around to James, they seen dollar signs. He was offering a barbershop, told James he can get him a barbershop. Laguerre, he set up with the chicken place where Laguerre can go eat, get food, you know, to eat. None, none of these brothers got jobs, huh? Mm-hmm. Only there's three of us without no jobs. True. But actually, how you think we feel, huh? We getting ready to do all this, huh? We ain't got no money in our pockets, huh? How you think we feel? Look at me, bro. Mm-hmm. How you think they feel? Yeah. If these brothers are doing for money, I don't need them. SubhanAllah. What no, I, t- I talked to them, them okay. already. They already know. Yeah, okay. okay. And They're not even worried about it. It is for, uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's all it is. And if they won't need for money or greediness, or they, they think they're going to make any money or, uh, or angerness, please do not, because this is jihad. This mm-hmm. is jihad. And that's what jihad is. But you, you know what they think, huh? Mm-hmm. They can use the money, though. Shit got deep, you know, when this man got C4 and this man got a, a damn real bomb. These bombs were these duffel bags that were filled with wires. There was an on and off switch which created a circuit and then there was a phone inside the box. And the way these bombs were supposed to work was that 
if you connected the wires and you turned on the switch and then you drove away and you called the phone in the bag from the phone that you had, it would blow up. You you ask him what you gonna do after you let the stinger go? Open up the pickup truck, shoot, put it down, and take off. And we can do it, huh? I'm telling you. It's simple math, huh? Where they thought they was going to go after this was done, I, I don't know. David thought that he was going to pay Lord medical bills. Alhamdulillah. Give me a kiss, brother. Okay, brother. Mm. Alhamdulillah. Brother, call us. Let what's us up? know what's up. Everything is fine. We are working on target right now. We are on target right now. Don't worry about it. Okay. Okay? Say no more. That's it. night of the bombing, the four of them drive up to Connecticut. They pick these bombs and weapons up and drive them back to New York. James Cromwell is in the back seat of the car and he's trying to wire the bombs. He's unable to wire them. He's forgotten his instructions. Shahed Hussein has to pull over and wire them for him. Back in the car, they proceed down to Riverdale. James Cromedy gets out of the car. He takes the bombs in these duffel bags. He opens up these two cars that have been placed in front of these temples, puts the bombs in the car, as James Cromedy is leaving these bombs in the car, he gets back in the car with the other three men and Shahid Hussein. The FBI says it has thwarted a terror plot. Federal agents moved in tonight and say their suspects are homegrown would-be terrorists. The men put what they believe to be bags of plastic explosives, C4, a total of 30 pounds, into the cars. But when they returned to their SUV, officers rushed the vehicle, smashed the windows, and made the arrests. What have you learned? There were four people involved, uh, all uh, uh, Muslims. And my understanding is, originally, this uh, emanated from the mosque in uh, Newburgh, New York. This is a group that we knew about. Uh, this is a group that, you know, through tripwires that we have set up, uh, through, you know, various communities, sources, and, and the like, networks that we have set up, uh, we're able to determine that, you know, there was a distinct interest by this group to conduct an attack. I heard this bang. I thought it was the kids banging on my door. The second bang, all I heard was FBI get down. Only thing I could say was I screamed from upstairs, Lord, don't move. They just kicked in the door. Well, at first we heard a real, like a loud boom, like boom, boom. And I, I thought it was next door. And then when they came in, it was like, they just they just rushed with like the, with like the assault rifles. and. I was, I mean, I was like, I was still weak because I, I, I'm just fresh from the hospital, so it was like, I could barely move. They had assault rifles, they had M16, grenades attached onto their bulletproof vest. They had some big rock wallers. Next thing I know, I seen a helicopter light beaming inside the room. People coming down out of helicopters in the tree. I said, is this for real? And I didn't know the significance until I 
calmed down and saw the badge on his thing. It said Homeland Security. And I said, I'm in some big shit. The bombs had been uh, uh, made by the FBI technicians. They were totally inert. No one was ever at risk. So, so they actually tried to purchase this material. They just happened to be purchasing it from the FBI. The arrest itself was a well-staged event. I think Hollywood would have been quite proud. They staged uh, a few blocks away from here. Uh, they used a, an 18-wheeler, a low boy, uh, as we call it. They then came in with what we call a Bearcat, which is a, a smaller armored vehicle. Members of the Joint Terrorist Task Force, uh, FBI, NYPD, state police investigators, moved in. They had a hundred police officers on scene. They had a tractor trailer come out and block their path. They had bomb squads. They had lights and sirens, none of which was required. Nobody's armed. Nobody has a bomb. Did you believe they were a genuine threat? Yes. Uh, based on what they, what they were attempting to do uh, and based on their actions. So why is that case important? Well, let's think about what we have there, right? So we have, we have, uh, we have Hussein, this entrepreneurial leader, if you will, who happens to be an FBI informant, spoiler alert. You have James Cremitic, kind of a ringleader, if you will, working kind of one-on-one -on -one with Hussein to kind of plan this operation. You have James uh, Williams, onto Williams, and then you have kind of Laguerre Payen, uh, right? Now, from a psychological, well, from a behavioral standpoint, what did they do? Right? All four of them laid bombs outside of a synagogue. They tried to get Stinger missiles. They said they were, gonna, they were doing reconnaissance on US Army Air Force bases. As the, as the press releases say, they are four radicalized or hardened terrorists, right? Out there trying to kill individuals. But from a psychological standpoint, are they all equal? Are they all culpable? And to what degree, in general, are they all culpable? Now, if you were going to look at them, let's look at them all as a whole for a second. Right? What are the factors that are affecting their decisions to engage in this behaviour? Well, I mean, I, I think that if you were to look at kind of if we would look at uh let me if i could get i can get it back up here if you were to look at their um if you were to look at them from a from a ferguson standpoint you know well where's their behavioral range coming from i mean it's coming from hussein he's the one giving them the ideas he's the one giving them the opportunities he's the one inciting them to do this with promises of a quarter of a million dollars mercedes food all the things you want in the world right so I don't know if their behaviours are coming from them. I don't know if they're, you know, I think the motivation in James's case is coming from him, but the others I don't think that's truly the case. So kind of in there, there's some interesting elements and almost from a impulse control or an inability to not do it, it's very hard not to do something when someone you perceive of being of power is enticing you and incentivizing you and asking you and pushing you. So there's... For all of them, I think, there's, there's elements in there that question the degree to which they were truly culpable. And, and in this case, they all went to jail for life, I believe. But ever since, it's been a hot button, a hot button and almost prototypified uh, FBI entrapment operation, arguing basically that they had no culpability and no intention, and they were, that was created for them or around them as part of this FBI case kind of back in 2008. But I think the more interesting question is, would you view all of them as equally culpable if you were lining all of them up um, and, 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 and assessing them from a psychological standpoint? And I think that it, it's very realistic to say that that's not the case. I mean, I, I think the broadest difference is, you know, James Cremiti to Laguerre Payen. I mean, you saw in the documentary that 
the psychological and environmental state that Laguerre Payen was living in, in terms of needing food and where he was living and a, a lack of opportunities. You even saw with Onter and James Williams, very proximate psychological motivations and needs that were encouraging or driving their behaviour. Now, I'm not saying that that means that all of them are innocent. I don't think that's the case at all. But there are grades of culpability based on the psychological existences of the individual. And our job, our job as a psychologist, is to assess the degree to which that impacts their culpability, culpability in this case. And you can see from that little example how unbelievably complicated that can be. You know, I mean, in, all, in any of those cases, right, so all four of those individuals, we could have looked at family, social influences, we could have looked genetically if we had the information, we could look at their personality, we can look at their behavioural range, we can look at their impulse control. You know, Laguerre Payen is a classic one, he's um, you know, comorbid with several mental health issues, that's obviously going to be a significant impact on his impulse control. So what psychology does, and what I don't want to give the impression of, I don't want to give the impression that what psychology is, is about forgiveness. That somebody is on trial and they bring in a psychologist to get them to be forgiven for what they've done. I do think there's a version of it where people do that and that's very, very bad. But I don't want you to think that that's what this is about. It's not only about forgiving. It's about understanding and it's about helping juries understand the immense complexity that exists within the etiology and creation of behaviour. Because we cannot solely judge just what somebody has done. Because their tapestry and their pathway to that can vary greatly within the individuals. And our job as psychologists, along the mantra of do no harm, is to make sure that the assessment of that individual is as accurate as possible based on what we know about how they are, how they behave, how they interact and how they exist in the real world. It is about nuance, it is about granularity and if anything it's trying its very hardest to make the decision made in the courts be the best